joyful to see you this day because this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We wish to welcome each and every one of you to Baptist Women's Day, which has been a long tradition here at Chatham Heights Baptist Church, but we've got a new slant. We are having with us today, and with a very warm welcome to everybody, but especially to the First Baptist Church family who's joining with us for Baptist Women's Day. And we want to certainly welcome our guest speaker, Reverend Libby, and a very cherished friend, Bonnie Lee Witt, not only to me, but to everyone who has had the opportunity to meet her. So to both of you women, we thank you and for the Baptist Women's Choir, <laughs> group of lovely ladies, a combined choir. Welcome, we're so happy to have everyone here on this very special day. Please take note of the announcements in the bulletin. They cover some very interesting things that are going to take place. Let me just sort of highlight several. The next Ecumenical Lenten Devotional Lunch will be held this coming Thursday at noon at Christ Episcopal Church. And just a reminder to the Chatham Heights fam family and anyone and everyone else who can join us, we will host the Lenten lunch on Thursday, March the 7th. Please read the insert on a screening documentary of Midwives of Movement, which kind of chronicles stories of women who really began the important emphasis and work of women in the Southern Baptist Convention. So please take note of that. It has a wonderful, interesting summary. Dr. Mike and Dr. Grammer will be doing a Zoom on Tuesday for Holy Week. And Dr. Mike gave me some specifics about technology, but he knows me and technology. So I hope that he will clarify maybe some of the particulars if you want to join on Zoom on Tuesday to kind of enter into Holy Week, certainly. And Caroline wants me to mention, don't forget about the spaghetti lunch that will take place after the worship service today. All of you are invited, and we look forward to having the opportunity to socialize a bit. So please come and be a part of that. In order to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. Oh, I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely, surely. The presence of the Lord is in this place. Blessings and welcome.
I'm going to ask you to stand as we do our call to worship, please. We gather as God's people in a world divided and distressed. We gather as one people united by God. We gather as God's people journeying to Jerusalem. We gather as one people steadfastly traveling forward together. We gather as God's people frightened by whirlpools of worry which spin us out of control. We gather as one people, following in the unfailing steps of Jesus Christ, whose name we praise. Thank you. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, the season of Lent is upon us. Nevertheless, as we were so many times before, we find that we are not truly ready for the special journey of discipleship. So many activities, responsibilities, and demands claim our lives and prevent us from the preparation required to take the important steps in faith at this moment. As we look at the obstacles to a readiness, we need to be reminded that Christ is with us every step of the way. We are not alone. Christ will lift our hearts and our spirits. He will direct our paths. Enable us, loving Savior, to take this journey of faith to a new life with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Would you join me in singing Great is Thy Faithfulness, found on page 54.
be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from Psalms 25, verses 1 through 10, a song of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll be reading a, a blessing titled, A Lenten Blessing in the Wilderness. God, here we are, starting down this Lytton path, a path of promise, of hope, and of refreshment. But we feel the pull of the mundane. It's a kind of restlessness, not some aberration, but the norm, because we know we live inside our own contingency, scrunched into time and circumstance, as if we have woken up in the middle of a play that has already started a plot in motion. But we have glimpsed its meaning, its end, and its glory. If only we could know the lines, the entrances and exits, the way to move through with grace and beauty and patience. Because it's your story, God, and ours. We live here in the in-between, bearing the weight of the paradox that simultaneously we see ourselves from the inside in our fragility and dependence, and at the same time from the outside in our heart-bursting possibility. And honestly, it is miserable sometimes, unless God, you walk us through this wilderness, step by step, because you know it from the inside out. Amen. Would you join me in singing our song, Lord Have Mercy? Christ 
Now would you join us in standing and singing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, page number 182.
Romans 5, chapter, Romans chapter 5, verse 11. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. As a way of recognizing our connection with Jesus, we bring our offerings today to help with the mission of furthering God's kingdom here on earth. Let us pray. All powerful creator of the universe, please bless these humble gifts and us to your service. Amen. children come up front and join me for a children's message <laughs> you're both awesome very cool good morning good morning come on. yeah yeah there's plenty of seats come on up oh my oh come on up charlotte How are y'all this morning? Good. Have y'all noticed anything differently? Was there anything different today going on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What? What do you think? You're at a different church. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And Chatham Heights kids, you see some new faces, don't you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll hold this, Charlotte. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I'll keep the microphone. Let's see. And there's there's other different things today. Other than a different church, today is the first Sunday of Lent. Your dress is really cool. Really cool dress. I love the pink. 
Oh, I love your dress too. I love the pink. <laughs> so who knows what Lent is? Does anybody know what Lent is? Yeah, Ella, what is Lent? I don't know. Oh, okay, that's okay. I know. Elena, what's Lent? Um, I don't know. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. So Lent is the 40 days, except for Sundays, the six it's weeks. 40 days. Uh-huh, it's the six weeks before Easter. Now, what is Easter? Yeah, oh, Easter's a holiday. No, it's a, a, the bunnies. bunnies. And what else, Elena? Um, egg, rabbit. Um, Something about Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she said it's when Jesus rises up from the dead. Absolutely. And so that's a celebration, right? So during Lent, we take time to pray together. Some people give things up, like um, some people give up meat. Some people pray. Some people fast, which means they don't eat at certain times of the day. Everybody does something a little different. And do you know what we're going to be doing as the kids at Chatham Heights and First Baptist? We're going to be praying. You each have a prayer partner, and you're going to be praying for your prayer partner and for the congregation and your family during Lent. Well, I have a song to teach all about Lent. Congregation, can you help us out? So it goes like this. I'll do a repeat after me style. Y'all up for it? Congregation's the church. Yeah. Okay. This is the season of Lent. This is the season of Lent. Lent is 40 days except for Sundays. Lent is 40 days except for Sundays. The color purple represents, the color purple represents preparation for Easter Day. Preparation for Easter Day. Very good. So during Lent, we have, oh, okay. we have purple that represents that we're getting ready for Easter. Okay, will y'all join me in prayer? Bow your head and close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us prepare for Easter Day. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, before you go, oh, we're going to try something different today. So real quick, oh, I'm just going to come down right here. Raise your hand if you are five or older. If you're five or older, you get to stay in the service today. And I have very special bags for you to um, participate in service with us. Well, Ava, I think that you're four. So you get to go with Mr. Jamie to Children's Church. So Ava and Alyssa, you can go to Children's Church now. I am six. You are. Okay. Here you go. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, come here, Alyssa. Okay, y'all, come line up and get a bag and then go sit down, okay? Ava and Alyssa are going to go with you. Ava and Alyssa, the pink and the turquoise. Oh, yeah, you can take a bath. Yeah, that's okay. You'll take these two. Go with Mr. Jamie. Okay. Okay. I can speak to Oh, okay. Go sit down, Charlotte.
morning. I was asked to introduce Libby and Bonnie Lee. Um, how do we do that? Um, our First Baptist friends, Libby has been your minister for over five years. Our Chatham Heights family has gotten to know Libby through our shared ministries, and she has preached here on several occasions. Bonnie Lee, um, we've seen Bonnie Lee minister to us in the hospitals. Um, some of us have seen her in other capacities. She has also preached at both churches. So I really don't know what else to say about these two fine ladies, except that what better women to preach to us on Baptist Women's Day than these two women whose passion is for women in ministry. They are both examples of what God can do in the lives of his people, no matter male or female. So on Baptist Women's Day, we celebrate God's calling in both your ministries, and we celebrate the calling to all the women who have served in both of our churches, who serve now, and who will serve to come in the future. So ladies. Thank you. And thank you for having us this Sunday, all of us, not just me. Uh, this is an exciting time to share in worship, not just for Baptist Women's Day, but in the first uh, Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent, of course, is a season of preparation, as we told our children, and it is a time for us to be more introspective, to look into our hearts and our souls, see where we are in our journey with Christ. So I'm grateful that we get to start that season together as two churches, but one ministry. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know if any of you have noticed when you're reading the four Gospels that they are a little bit different. And the Gospel of Mark, more than the other three Gospels, gets straight to the point. The action in Mark's Gospel happens in really quick succession. Verses 9 to 11 of our passage today, so just a couple of verses here, Tell us about Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. The sky is tear open. God's voice proclaims Jesus as God's Son and Beloved. Then in verse 12, boom, we shift. The Spirit immediately drives Jesus into the wilderness. Verse 13 then says, Jesus is tempted for 40 days by Satan in the wilderness, surrounded by wild beasts, and then angels wait on him. And then in 14 and 15, the camera pans back to John being arrested and Jesus arriving to Galilee to preach the good news of the kingdom of God and how people should repent and believe. Now, I'm pretty sure, and I, I did go back and check, Matthew and Luke take at least two full chapters to cover these items, and Mark has done it in just a handful of verses. In Matthew and Luke, there's this explanation of everything that's going on. He draws the stories out, giving other focuses and details. But Mark just tells it to us straight, no frills. But what caught my eye as I read this passage and considered my own 40-day Lenten journey and ours collectively is what's right in the middle, those 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness. You'll notice there's no dialogue in our passage about the wilderness, about the temptation. We don't get those fleshed out versions that Matthew and Luke give us. 
We can't reflect on exactly what tempted Jesus and how Jesus avoided sinning. We just know that Jesus is there in the wilderness of our human struggle. And he comes out of it in one piece, held together by God's messengers after surviving a long time in what we can only imagine was pain and anguish. Just like Moses had led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years and was tested every step of the way, now Jesus is tempted and tested too for 40 days in the wilderness. Just as Adam was tempted in the garden, now Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. Mark tells us in a very short few words that this temptation in the wilderness and the wandering is part of the larger story of the people of God. But you know, it's almost gratuitous that the Son of God is being tempted, isn't it? Of course he can withstand it. Yet why did he? What is the purpose of the presence of God on earth facing the harshest realities of evil alone in the wilderness? Well, I think it's that just like Jesus didn't need to be baptized, as he had nothing to wash clean up, Jesus chose to fully partake in our humanity. One pastor put it this way, Jesus' baptism is a clear move to identify with people where they are. Jesus does not stand aloof from our sin, but reaches down into the water with us where we are. He descends into our world as it is, ready to step into the effects of our sin and self-destruction. Jesus began his ministry in those waters of baptism, a place of naming and promising, a place of solidarity with humanity. And then Jesus immediately found himself in the wilderness facing everything that you and I might face, and yet choosing not to give in, choosing not to lose hope. And it's from that wilderness that Jesus emerges to tell the story. Even as John is arrested and we know will die for his message, Jesus says the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. If the ministry of Jesus begins in the deepest parts of our humanity, facing the darkest nights of our souls in the wilderness, it ought to remind us of just how amazing it is to worship a God who chooses to come alongside us like that, sacrificing heaven to live here on earth. One pastor put it this way, God rolled up his sleeves and got his hands dirty in the creation he made. Jesus was meant to be a way for us to reconcile with God. God was looking for ways to come alongside us like God had never done before so that we would know once and for all we are not alone in our wilderness journeys. I think that Lent is a really excellent time to take seriously just what an amazing thing it is that God has chosen to love us in this way. And it ought to inspire us to find ways to live that kind of sacrificial love into others' lives as well. So many of us will experience wilderness whether caused by our own sinful choices or the evils that penetrate systems of this world and leave so many behind in their wake, or perhaps simply the wilderness of pain that our own mortality leaves us with awash with grief and despair and worry. Jesus, God with us, chose to come in to those painful situations and to sacrificially love us, each one of us, in such a way that changes the whole world. Most of us can probably think of someone who loved us like this in our own lives. That someone who stuck by you in the depths, 
who helped you find your way back out. That person for that season was the hands and feet of Jesus in your life. And for many of us, we have been that person to hold the hand of another, guiding them through their wilderness as we have also been guided. We have stood steady when they could not. We've helped them face their demons, whether temptations they're fighting to overcome or simply pain that has crushed their souls. One person that I have gotten to know in the last five and a half years of, that has been doing this exact kind of work here in Martinsville is Reverend Bonnie Lee Witt. When I arrived in Martinsville, she was the hospital's director of pastoral care. She was the one at bedsides in the hardest and most nerve-wracking parts of people's lives. And beyond that, she took calls day and night from our community members who were in pain. When I think about someone who helps people walk through wildernesses, who serves as the hands and feet of Christ in people's darkest hours, I think of Bonnie Lee. Her ministry has changed since the pandemic, and yet her call to sacrificial love has not. So with Bonnie Lee and a few others and other sermons as we go along in the series and Lent, I want to ask a few questions about their ministry and what they're up to. And so today we'll hear from Bonnie Lee. So Bonnie Lee, tell us a little bit about you. What is your story of being called to this kind of work in ministry? Well, that is a, a short question, but it has a long answer, but I'm going to kind of get to the point here, as Mark did. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, uh, I am still amazed that I am a chaplain and that I was called. And sometimes I feel it strongly uh, that this was what God meant to be, and sometimes still I wonder, like, oh my gosh, you know, this has been a long journey, 30 years of ministry. But I have to share with you, I did not pursue it. It was something that uh, came up in my life, and I still didn't know what was going on. And I just felt this very strong push and pull it wasn't like something I was drawn to. It was like God got behind me. I tell people ask me a lot of times, says, Bonnie Lee, is there a God? I said, yes, because I'm doing this. <laughs> I would have never thought. But all that being said, um, God prepares you when you don't even know you're being prepared. And this journey has opened my eyes to a lot of uh, things about life, about myself. Um, I, I even remember, I think the first understanding of God in my life was when I was a little, little girl and I was questioning the origin of God. I mean, how deep can that go? And so that has followed me all my life. And then when I was 30, um, I got this, this push, pushing sensation and pulling sensation and all of a sudden, next thing I know, I was um, giving up my first vocation and looking at all the pathways to go into hospital chaplaincy. And I did not know that God wanted me to be a hospital chaplain until one uh, day in Atlanta, Georgia, Emory University Hospital, and my brother had a tumor on his pituitary gland. And we uh, loaded up our you know, our dysfunctional family. We went to Atlanta, big city, you know, and it's like, next thing I know, this very small, petite, frame little girl walks into the room, and she says, or young woman walks into the room, and she says, I'm so-and-so, I'm your chaplain. And it was like something exploded inside. And I said, that's it. And so there I was on my journey to becoming a hospital chaplain. So, you know, when I look at being called, I look at 
God calls us in all kinds of ways. And this real connection for me with God, even though I grew up in church, uh, my real connection is with God in nature and with my life experiences. And it seems like God has always been present in these particular areas of my life. And, and when we look at the calling of us all, it's not just, you know, to be in ministry. Our calling to be parents, our calling to be teachers, our calling to be first responders and healthcare, you know, uh, responders and uh, healthcare workers. And we all have callings. And, and so it's, it's very important for us to understand that concept, you know, is that we're ca all called. You know, life is fragile. If anything has taught me about this journey is life is fragile. And that can be overwhelming in many ways, but when you find this connection with God and, you know, all the, the hymns we've been singing this morning, all the, the messages, the, uh, the devotions, uh, it really speaks loud to who God is in our life and God's presence. I was an introvert, and most people think that I'm an extrovert because I come into the room glowing and smiling and laughing and, you know, making connections with people. But that's God in me. And I'm not just saying that. That's God in me. That's God in all of you. The moments in life that we connect with other people, with God, with nature, with all of God's creation, that is God's presence. That's God within us. So, you know, when I look at being an introvert and then moving into extrovert, that's ministry. It's like my whole personality, my whole aura changes. It's like as soon as a person comes into my purview, it's like I'm right there. God has placed somebody in that path and that person becomes the most important person to me at that moment. I open my ears, I open my heart, and I listen. I listen to their story. And that story is powerful. That story shares with me where they've been in the wilderness. And sometimes when we're in the wilderness, we don't know what direction to go. We don't know what to do. Our thoughts and our emotions get all scrambled up. And all of a sudden, God meets us where we are. And God comes in all kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. The other thing about it is even when I was a little child, I was very self-aware, probably too self-absorbed. <laughs> and I had to look at moving myself from a sense of self, being self-absorbed, worried and afraid about everything, and moving out of that, that mindset and becoming absorbed in life and other people's journeys. The wilderness is a place of transformation, a place where God enters our world and meets us where we are. This is the foundation, foundational context of pastoral care. We meet folks where they are, the place where they are vulnerable, searching for meaning and direction, leading them to a place of reflection and knowing. When people are encountering transformation, it's a process of letting go of the old and embracing a new way of thinking and being. Offering pastoral care to those who find themselves in the wilderness of loss and grief, life transitions, and other stressful situations are in need of care to the heart and the soul through sustaining, reframing, guiding, and reconciling. Those are the four things that are always in my mind and heart. Well, Bonnie Lee, as you tell us your call and, and what 
what it means to you. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the community that you're serving. Who are they? How do they find you? I know it's definitely different than what it used to be because you were always standing at the hospital, but these days <laughs> yeah. you are doing things different ways. And then tell us a little bit about who these people are. What, what do we know about them and how are you serving them now? Right. Well, you know, it's, that's a good question. Uh, I kind of look at it in this way. Uh, being in a hospital, people think, okay, you know, health care issues, um, people who are sick, suffering, death and dying, those are real issues in the hospital. But guess what? When you come into the hospital setting, you bring everything with you, everything else that you're going through. And so it, in some ways it's different what I'm doing now because the setting and the environment is a little different, but there's, it's no difference of people being in crisis. People in crisis can be anyone, you know, anyone. When the life of anyone is in, interrupted by a life altering event or crisis, we feel vulnerable. You know, being in the wilderness, yes, Mark doesn't say much about what Jesus is going through, but you know something? Even Jesus, I feel, felt vulnerable. He felt tempted, he felt stressed, he felt disoriented, and yet this encounter with what we refer to as evil sometimes is the dark side of our soul. It's the shadow side of who we are. And we have to really keep that in mind. There's a sense of fear and anxiousness when we are in the wilderness, but you know something? You know where I live? I live in the wilderness, literally. <laughs> I live in a cabin in the woods. I got my cowboy boots to prove it. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I'm comfortable with being me and I'm comfortable truly in the wilderness because, you know, the wilderness has things to teach us, doesn't it? I have this deer, her name is Maggie. She's been coming up in my front yard every day. You know, I, I always saw deer all, all over the place, but, you know, Maggie's been teaching me about deer, how deer actually are nocturnal, and they come out and they feed during the day, but they don't nap and they sleep and then they eat and they nap and they sleep, but they're all up at nighttime. Maggie has taught me that deer love bananas and potatoes and all good stuff, but they do not like broccoli. <laughs> I'm being a little funny here because I'm making a point. I paid attention to Maggie. Maggie taught me something about the wilderness. The leaves, when a storm comes in, the leaves turn a certain way, the wind blows, right? It shows the underside of the leaf. When you pay attention to these things, and even Jesus in his teachings, he brought out a lot about nature. Learn from it. I learn from nature. I learn, learn from every human being I meet. And I'm certainly not Mother Teresa because there's a lot of stuff going on in my head, between my ears, and I have to be intentional about letting God transfer those core values that I have and keep growing those beliefs that I have, but also to reshape the things I may not think so good about people. Because every human being, I forgot who, one of my favorite theologians made this quote, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Every human being you encounter, no matter who they are, where they come from, whatever, they are spiritual being. And sometimes spiritual beings are in the wilderness and they respond to the wilderness and sometimes they transfer and project that onto life in not so healthy ways. You know, we Baptists talk about sin a lot, right? I'll never forget the day <clears throat> that I learned in seminary that Jesus interprets sin as a person in need. A person in need. 
everybody's in need. Everybody has needs, and it's up to us to minister to them in those needs. So when we look at the population, so here are some facts. So from the West Piedmont Health District, and these are not the best statistics for Martinsville and Henry County, but you know something, that means we're in the wilderness. And if any place in Virginia needs help and love and care and understanding and healing, it's us. So West Piedmont Health District, and this is 2020 statistics, deaths due to drug overdose, 23 in Henry County, 35 in Martinsville. Violent crimes, 227 in Henry County, Martinsville, 282. Suicide rate, Henry County, 18, Martinsville, 19. Henry County, uh, Henry Martinsville Community Health Equity Assessment 2023, along with the Harvest Foundation, 46.4% of population live below the 200% of the federal poverty rate. 120 unhoused people were identified in 2023. And taken from the Martinsville Bulletin, the Virginia Department of Health study shows concerning health statistics for Martinsville. One in four adults in Henry County and Martinsville suffer from a major depressive disorder. Teen pregnancy rate in Martinsville is 61 per 1,000, triple that of the state. Henry County is on the top 10 localities in Virginia for fatal drug overdose. Now, these statistics are real to me because when you work in a hospital, all these stati statistics usually come through our ER. And I've been there. I've been with families, grieving, heartbroken. You can't, you can't put a Band-Aid on these statistics. You can't just say, okay, well, this is how it's going to be because people are hurting. When we look at who is out there hurting, it can be anyone. Don't take it for granted. I got a call last week from a good friend who I thought I'd be getting a call with her taking her own life, but it was her sister. She attempted suicide, and you would have never thought it would have been her. Thank God she did not complete the task. But you know, we feel relieved when we hear that, but at the same time, there's a journey ahead of her. There's a journey ahead of us to be of care. So when we look at who, when I look at who I'm helping, I'm not going to put any statistics out there. I'm not going to put any compartmentalization to, you know, the human soul. It's just whoever's hurting is who I help. And if I don't have the skill set to do that, then I'm going to find the best resources I can for that human being, that spiritual being. Well, in that, in that case, we know who you serve obviously a lot of people in distress in our local community. Right. But how do you serve this community now in different ways than what you used to do pre-pandemic? Thank you for asking. And I'm, I'm gonna be, see chaplains are trained to be <clears throat> transparent. This is a very different setup to go through on a Sunday morning and I like it, but I know I feel like I'm failing at it, but at the same time, thank you for your patience on this. So, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I just cut through the stuff. I, I, I want to feel relaxed and talking with all of you and not feel like I'm up here some famous person or something, because I'm not. Um, but chaplains are trained 
to triage. You know, like when you go to the ER, you have to see the triage nurse first, and they're taking symptoms. They're taking your blood pressure, they're taking your temperature, they're asking you questions about your symptoms. Well, chaplains are trained to do that. People are always asking me, chaplain, what are the right things to say? What are the right words? Trust me, you, there's no script. I don't serve through a script. I serve through my heart and my mind and my training, my skills. So when a person comes to me, I'm gonna do that triage part. And I'm gonna listen to their story. I'm gonna ask them to share with me what's going on. What's that like for you? You know, most people when they come up to you and they say, I'm going through this, you don't know what to say or do, do you? It's, it's terrifying to help people. But my little brain is just assessing, gathering information, and I'm looking for themes. I'm looking for the life themes. And to, in today's world, oh my gosh, those life themes, I talk with my hands, life themes are layered, layered of hurt and pain and suffering. And that's a lot to sort through. I can't do it in 45 minutes. I can't do, you know, what I would like to do is be with that person all day and just take time with them. So I have to kind of do some shortcuts and say, okay, after I hear what's going on, how have you been coping with this? I want to hear how they've been coping with it. And if I can navigate them or guide them to some more healthier ways of coping with things, that's, that's a God thing. It's empowerment. I don't tell a person what to do or advise them, well, you better do this. I'm going to say, what works best for you? How can you move from where you're at to where you want to be? Theologically, that's a journey from a sense of brokenness to a sense of wholeness. Listening and bringing a non-anxious presence. I think most of you have known me for you know, a long time, and I do. I have my own anxiety issues. <laughs> you might. So you see me like, woo, 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 you know. But when a crisis happens, non-anxious presence. Life has a way of turning you upside down and inside out. And sometimes, you know, in religion, it kind of gives you a sense of, a false sense of understanding that life is supposed to be wonderful and beautiful and better roses. I don't think I've met one human being that has been on that journey of, of better roses. It has its good moments, it has its not so good moments. It has its moments of heartbreak and pain like you just can't even imagine. But what we do when we minister and what God does with Je did with Jesus in that wilderness was he was there. He showed up. He was present. And each and every one of us can learn to do that, to show up and be present. You don't have to have the right words or the answers. How do people find you, Bonnie Lee? You know, I, that is a good question because it's like at the hospital page or phone overhead. <laughs> and I was so geared towards that, right? This is different. This is different. I am so blessed to have a community that sees the need that our community is really hurting. I also am blessed to have uh, churches that um, support this type of ministry, and I'm very thankful for First Baptist Martinsville and for Chatham Heights Baptist Church for allowing me to keep on ministering. Because you know something, the past three years without that job title as chaplain, I've been in my wilderness, and God has taught me something very important. I don't need a label. I don't need an office space, although I do. But you know what I'm saying. It's like 
I can be out there at the grocery store in the cashier line and people are hurting. I can be at the flea market and people are hurting. I can be at the pet store, people are hurting. I can go in and pay a bill somewhere, people are hurting. But at the same time, this is how you can reach me. So, First Baptist has generously offered an office space, which I am very thankful for, and use of classroom and the use of a little chapel in the back, which is very beautiful. So I, I've got to get adjusted to all this, and so it's a work in progress, but um, I won't be available probably until the end of February or the 1st of March, and the reason for that is because I'm waiting for my professional insurance to take hold and you have to go through application process and that takes about two to three weeks so that's where I'm at so but when I'm able to provide this service you'll get information I'll give that to uh, Mike and to Libby and disperse that information um, I'll have a phone number also the cards I gave Mike some cards and my uh, business card is out there um, but wait till you get the word. I mean, you can call me anytime. You know what I'm saying. I'm here for you. You can call me anytime. But, um, but to hold appointments with people, I'll hold, you know, make appointments. I'll have classes. I'm just, uh, the past year I've been doing stress management classes for spiritual and emotional well being. Uh, so I'll be doing more classes like that. I'll be doing grief care classes. I'll be doing, um, holding classes for, uh, first responders and healthcare workers, and I'm just trying to um, get the information out there uh, and resources to help folks. And I do it in a way, um, I like the educational piece because the support group people, it's hard for people to show up to support groups, right? It's very difficult. So I think, um, you know, having an educational piece is very important. Um, so um, that being said, um, you know, Libby and Mike are, will be resources for me and getting information out there. You'll probably see flyers in store, you know, restaurants and cafes and other places and funeral homes and places like that. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Bonnie Lee. Thank you. And thank you for your ministry ongoing. Well, thank as you. it changes and morphs <laughs> and becomes the butterfly it needs to be. Well, thank you. The transformation. The yes. yes. Thank you. For the season of Lent, I hope that all of us can find ways to love sacrificially as Christ's body in the world. As the Big C Church, not either one of our churches or any one church, but all of us together as Christians would live out that good news Jesus came to proclaim. So as Bonnie Lee begins to morph and transform and plant herself in a new office space, I hope that you will help her to reach those who are hurting and grief and stress and that all of us together might be the hands and feet of Christ in new ways. I hope that we partner with you well, that we help our community in need find what it needs in pastoral care and love. Thank you, Bonnie Lee, and amen. Would you stand and join us in our hymn of response, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling, page 312.
real quickly before we go, just a couple announcements for what's to come. Children, as you um, come with your parents, go ahead and put your worship bag on the front pew so we can use them next Sunday. And then we would love for y'all to join us for the spaghetti lunch downstairs in the fellowship hall. And um, we'll pray for the food down there. Then I'll call the prayer partners up and um, so we can get paired with one another and the prayer partners will go through the line first and then everybody else will be able to go through. I uh, hope to see y'all downstairs at lunch.